Hi, I'm Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. All right. Well, thank you, Mac. We are here once again, West Point, Mississippi, home of Mossy Oak brand camo. Lanny. We got some new equipment. We we do. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I don't it, either. Then. The microphones are gone. Yeah. And uh, so you know, there's been people in the past complain that we sounded like we were in a uh, bathroom, but basically uh, we were at times. Yeah. But so th- this is supposed to sound better. Yeah. Well, Richie's been working hard on it, so we hope it sounds better. So we've been listening to the reviews. Yeah. And Dudley, you don't have a clamp on your microphone anymore. You I look know. Pretty professional. But somebody put the clamp on it anyway. <laughs> But I took it off. Yeah, so at the end of the table is Toxie, who's emailing somebody, I think. I'm not, I am I'm not. not certain. But He's probably looking at Onyx. You've got mail. Probably looking at Onyx. And then sitting next to uh, to Toxie is David Holly. Mr. The David Holly. Yeah, baby. Mossy Oak property. Shocked to be here. We're Surprised excited to, be here. Excited to you have came him. In, you got the parking yeah, lot. Yeah, but it's yeah, right in his in. wheelhouse <laughs> on this, <laughs> this yeah, episode. Right. We're going to talk turkeys a little bit. And, uh, and, and David, uh, nobody loves them any more than David does. No doubt. I really don't know if there is anyone who no. loves turkeys more than David Hall. Well, and, and is, it's also as passionate about, you know, I'll get up there with him, but habitat management and just bleeding to, you know, as Whatever Marcus said, do. make one yeah. before you take one. He is all about making yeah. one yeah. big yeah. time. Yes, he is. Yeah. So, and and uh, curator thank of Wild Turkey Report. I mean, he's got all kind of stuff going on. His this is life. Yes, Wild Turkey you know, Report is a great follow. I tried follow. to keep that a secret for a long time. And it just, uh, yeah, oh. Somehow it got out, so the veil's off. Well, that's good. You're doing <laughs> so good you're work. Like the, so you're like the veil needs to be pulled. Once helmet. again, I'm going to request that you move your microphone in front of your okay. mouth. There, Tango too. Would, please. <laughs> I don't coach football, so I don't really know how to use one of these. Yeah. Well, is that better? Gonna, can we get an assistant over there to help him move yeah. his microphone when they're please? I didn't have any prep on this. Y'all just threw me in this chair. Well, we saw you show up you in go. the office today, and we knew we needed okay. you. Here's what's yeah. funny, though. I, I pull in the parking lot. I'm like, I need to talk to David. And I pull in the parking lot, put the car in park, dial David. Hey, hey, what's going on? He said, are you in your parking lot? And I said, yeah. And he was sitting right beside me. <laughs> Look over to your left. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Did y'all see that? My chair just uh, oh. I just sank down in my chair. There. There's all kinds of funny stuff going on. Yeah. I bet I bet we Vandy could. did that. Uh, He's pranking uh, you. Yeah, it, is, it could be. Could be. Well, uh, if boy, it, it, it's gotten hot outside, and our thoughts are kind of turned to warm season food plots. Yes, yes. We had yes. a good one with Bronson last week. Mm-hmm. Learned a lot from him, as we always do. But. I wanted to talk real quick. Max got a commercial prepared for us, but boy, guys, coming up is time to plant chufas, and that's a great thing that that people can do to help their their local turkey population. No doubt I mean, about turkeys it. Turkeys absolutely love them. I brought some in a ziploc bag. They're delicious. Dudley loves to eat them. What do they taste like, Dudley? Um, Toxy, help me. It's like a kind of like an almond. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, it's almost like a little bit of a coconut flavor, yeah. but it has an almond too. Almond coconut. Yeah, they're mm. delicious. They're, They're like teeny little potatoes, but I would say they have got a little bit of a coconut flavor, a little almondy, you know, got a bunch of fiber in them. I mean, they're supposed to be real nutritious, too. And there's a drink in yeah. Spain that they oh, yeah. make out That's of. That's right. Huh? Really? Uh, hor- 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 horchata. Or something? Horchata. There you go. Hor- Can we get some of that? Yeah. We need to try some of that. Yeah. We need to try to we make could it. Get, uh, we could get Sam to make yeah. it for us. Well, the, awesome. the magic of them is something turkeys really, really adore and love. But lots of other wildlife does too. Your deer lead them, but especially like raccoons, stuff that digs. And the worst of all is the plague of the century, the hogs. And so that's what's kind of hit people in the head from not planting them, including me. We literally had to build hog wire, no pun intended, around a food plot to be able to plant anything like that. Because once they discover them, it's all over. They will, you can't kill enough hogs. From a spot once Period. they find them. It just, <laughs> yeah. it just keeps on. So uh, that part's sad. If you don't have a hog problem and have the right kind of soil for it, they are tremendous. Simply because they last for so much longer than exposed seed or whatever. You know, they're so succulent. They love them, and they'll just keep going back, digging and digging and digging to find them. 
Uh, and not only that, one other thing you talk about, the, the habitat improvement, they're a great place to trap your nest predators because it attracts them to the field that you planted ah, too. Yeah, that's it's a great place to, to trap. And you know, it's so that. hard to trap nest predators and scour the countryside and find the little runs in the creeks and stuff. David works at that really, really hard, and it's a lot of work. But if you can find them in concentrated areas like a fish pond or something, you know, where you somebody had a deer feeder running from deer season is a great place. But these cheaper patches are a great place to catch those nest predators. Mm. <laughs> you know, and there's I'm, I'm hearing a lot of fe- people plant chufas for diving ducks. Yep. That Lake Catalula, Catahoula yep. hmm. in Louisiana. That I know that. Well, just, uh, there's one, so some of the best native, uh, That's a nut you know, moist soil plants are actually sedge grasses yeah, and stuff that grows a little nodules yeah. already. So. You can include mallards and all that stuff in that. It if is they're neat. in a soil, you know, I mean, a water shallow enough to get down there and right. dig in through the mud, you know, they'll eat them. I promise you they'll eat them in the it's right soil. the exact you, same see? genus and species as yellow nut sedge. Exactly, mm-hmm. which is a, a great waterfowl, hmm. you know, sedge. Yep. Well, heck. Lanny, did you see Tyson's eyes light up when he started talking about mallards? I mean, he, he was already excited about turkeys. And then about, he just gets so excited. It's like the first time. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You got, you all got children. I mean, do you love one any more than the other ones? No. You love them all with all your heart. That's right. And so I love them all the same, you know. Well, it reminds me of that time that we told him that Jitterbug was coming out with a smartphone. He got all excited about that. What's a jitterbug? Yeah, I got okay. that. That, that joke <laughs> fell. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Matt, would you, would you try you, again? Would you tell us about the uh, wrong would again? You tell us about the moving on, moving on, moving on. Yeah, so the commercial this week is going to be uh, our biologic warm season food plot seed. So we've got our NWTF turkey gold chufa. We've got our soybeans your spring protein peas and the key to all this is if you're a gamekeeper member you get a 10 percent discount on those on those seeds yeah so if you wow. subscribe to the magazine you get 10 percent off so what where do they go what's the website mac at plantbiologic.com okay you had to know what the website was well i like to hear him say it okay. he sounds he does, he's got he that announcer really voice job. going on so hey sure look does. i mean it's time to get him in the ground to grow you know yeah it's, it's coming up it's time to get it out yeah. there for him. June's so. a great month on yeah. the Chufus. Uh, everything. So, so before we leave Chufus Talks, you've planted a bunch. Have you got any tips, anything you've learned the hard way that would help a guy that's new to planting Chufus? I mean, it depends on if it's new. Yeah, if you're new, this wouldn't. But if your turkeys are used to them, uh, I actually try to plant them as late as I can and not early because – they're going to just eat them up quicker, and they'll be gone, you know, before the winter. And especially the spring, it's great to have them and keeping turkeys on your place in the spring if they're still around. Especially once it gets warmer and wet, they kind of go back and, and generate seed. So uh, I would say plant them later, but also they get their best in obviously loose and sandy soil. So watch the weather and try to time it where you would, you know, right before a big rain would be good. Uh, the other thing would be um, – it's tough. Also, you're, you you got to consider the weed control, which you can do well in chufas, but what you can't do is control other nut sedges. So when you see a stand of nut sedge of some form out there and you've planted chufas, you don't know for sure that it's chufas or something wild that's not productive. So I would be sure and prepare my place a little better. Maybe it's just glyphosate or something that nukes everything there, especially the other nut sedges. There are some image and some other herbicides for nut sedge specifically, but I think there's residual may hurt your chufas. Point was, just consider all that. You're, and don't plant them too thick because you won't produce a lot of seed. That's another thing. And, you know, just like everything else, it's very important to, to test the soil for lime. And you can ask specifically for growing chufa, and it'll give you a what you need to do to your soil. You'll get so much more by preparing your soil properly, even if you wait another year to get it right. And don't try to plant too many. And uh, you you could pull up one plant, might have 50 nodules or more on the roots if you do them right. Yeah. Go ahead, Lane. I got to kind of bounce back to Dudley. Are there any of those in that sedge family that are out there that you could just fertilize anyways? <laughs> Well, uh, Toxie's going to make fun of me for this, but I've tasted several, and uh, <laughs> they're really bitter. Uh. The Chufa's the only one that has that really good flavor. <laughs> so, But I found uh, nut sedge. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've seen nodules before. That's what I've yeah, I found yeah, them in, yeah. in ducks' crops before. Turkeys, too. Yeah. So Where they, they will turkeys. eat it. Yep. Just like not cur- voraciously like they do. Chufas. Chufas. That's right. Correct me if I'm wrong. The chufas are going to be a little bit darker in green on their stem, 
and the yellow nut sage is going to throw that kind of flower at the top. Uh, okay. Right. Well, you, yeah, you you have probably had more experience with it than I have. The best well, thing to do is can just get rid of everything in the plot. If you've got a lot of nut, natural nut sage already going on, you're so better off to take your time right. and get rid of all that, whatever you got to do first, and start pure because they will infect your chiefs word to the point – what will happen is, I mean, you still get germination on chifas, but they're so crowded, nothing puts on any seed to speak of. Or you might have a plant put one or two or three little tubers on there. So that would probably be almost more important than the the, the soil testing to sure. me. Yeah, yeah, getting rid of because that Because if you can get up, I mean, they'll grow, and they do, you know, even if you don't fertilize much, they, you know, they love nitrate, like yeah. a lot of stuff, grasses like that. They love nitrate. And so I would... If you really want to do it right and you got a great place, prepare it, get rid of everything. Just you don't want to sterilize the soil, but theoretically, and and pour the the you know the fertilizer to them because they'll really produce a lot of food. Mm -hmm. You know the fascinating thing about chiefers to me is how do they find, how do the turkeys find them? Yeah, that's that's funny. Sometimes it's taken forever, and sometimes it's just like overnight. David had to train their turkeys for a year or so, pretty much, didn't you? Well, and especially when we started the fences, you know, one plot yeah. would have turkey scratching all in, and the other one would have the prettiest stand of chief foot, and they just took them forever to get in there. Huh. But it's a must. I mean, it was a capital investment for us. We yeah. just said, look, we want to have turkeys. We want to plant chiefs. We just got to bite the bullet and do this. Yeah. Yep, me too. And eventually they got in there. They finally have learned. It took me about, I would say they got in there a little bit in two years. But it took a while, and now they know they're in there, and they get in them. And so it's actually good that they're a little bit slower with them because I'm telling you, worst problem, once they find they're there and they're used to them and you train them, they wear them out before, you know, the winter is even over. Yeah, and I bet even when you go into to plant them, they're probably. Some, yeah. but it's not the same because you got them spread out everywhere. Right. What you can't mess with is hogs. Right. You just can't. Mm. It's just a waste. It's a complete waste. So, you know, electric fence maybe is a cheaper way mm -hmm. than doing hog wire. Yeah. Uh, you know, but. Yeah. but. David, what's going on in your world right now? Or did, did I hear right you're doing some growing season burns? Well, not quite yet, but we are working on an article Dudley helped me with, Marcus Lashley helped me with, about late growing season burns. That's something I've been doing a little bit more of the last few years, um, starting as early as 1st of September. And the reason why. I'm doing that is a lot of our stands, we've got this heavy hardwood understory that's kind of come about. Sweet mm -hmm. gum, yopon, stuff yeah. like that. If you look at the natural fire regime, what I mean, what Mother Nature was doing, it was all lightning strikes. And so the peak season of that was from about June until the middle of September. So if we want to more closely replicate that, we need to be rethinking our timing on our burn windows a little bit. Mm. And so... A lot of people think about these, when you know these growing season burns as being these really intense, ripping and roaring fires. That is the absolute opposite of what I've, I've experienced. Now, it's finicky because you got tougher conditions, you know, to find the right window between drought conditions and like last year was too much rain. But the fire itself, if you can get a fire just to creep through a stand, uh, you'll see some pictures in this gamekeeper article that. I submitted to Todd the other day. It's pretty impressive the difference in the hardwood control when you're burning in this late growing season window versus a dormant season burn. Yeah, I'm not really sure where the where or when the definition of growing season burn shifted, but you nowadays it seems like if you're burning after the month of February, they're yeah. calling it a growing yeah. season burn. And I don't personally personally no. I, I don't know if I agree with that. No. Um so I, well, I think the the definition that we're looking for is you do the the recolonization of whatever plants are there changes from February to May to July August, and so I feel like from listening to everybody so much, you do you do end up that later summer burn creates more like legumes and forbs and stuff that are more beneficial, maybe especially to deer, but everything than maybe. The stuff in February and everything's dormant just kind of helps everything across the board. So, I mean, it just seems like even from the earliest days, listening to Dr. Woods, who was so smart about this and a pioneer so much, he would always say your best, especially for the deer, was a summer burn, if you can do it. 
and I remember from those days. But like Marcus said, hey, the best time to burn is when you can. No doubt. Yeah, we've we got to get more fire on the ground, and this gives people an option of how to do it. It's it's not a tool that you're going to be able to burn two or three hundred acres a time like you can in the 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 spring or excuse me the dormant season. But if you've got some of these problem stands where you got a lot of sweet gum, maybe a strip of thirty or forty yards on the side of a road, put you a break around that, get you a good day where it's not too dry, just let it creep through there, and I yeah. think you'll be pretty surprised that the results come you know the next april or may i'll bet you in most places if you've got some sunlight coming through now maybe not in a what i'm about to say is not maybe in a completely canopy overstory but a place with some sunlight coming down through the ground burn a small area and say i would say august maybe late july and if you get rain i would say pretty cheap too just burn a small area you know whatever acre or two fertilize it just fertilize the natural and watch what happens to the deer you'll attract. As long as you're getting some sunlight in there. Right. I'll bet you that could be as deadly of a plot almost as something you plant because it'd be so much more comfortable yeah. coming to feed there. Uh, Marcus Lashley was playing with that a bit uh, in the last couple of years. I think he was calling them bow season burns mm -hmm. or bow stand burns. Bow range burning. Bow range burning. Uh, really interesting concept. Um and there's, there's so much controversy uh, talking about these growing season burns because a lot of them are happening in the nesting season. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to get too deep into that. No. But uh, mm. uh, I, th I think a lot of folks are misunderstanding that a, a burn in February uh, brings different species back compared to maybe a burn in July through right. October. Yes. Um, it's not the same. Right. Um, and then so now it seems like we're doing our winter burns, uh, you know, like in mostly the month of February. And as soon as spring springs, you know, March and April, we're calling that a growing season burn. But you're really getting the same effect as if you were burning in February. Right. And so um, I'm... Like David, I'm thinking that needs to shift, and we need to have a, you know, our winter burns are in February and March, and our March growing January. season burns are after the nesting season. Yeah, and I remember but, Marcus saying that his research indicated even if you lost some nests, it would more than compensate with the increases in the nest success or whatever. I can't myself, cannot condone that. I cannot burn up a hen nest. I can't do it. So... I'm I, like, Dudley, if you get the same effect in July, and you still might get a really, really late one, but odds are you're safe after 4th of July. Right, better effect. Yeah. And that's what Marcus pointed out in our feedback is that studies are showing that these early growing season burns in April don't have the, the long-term effect on hardwood encroachment because there's so much nutrient still coming out of the root that right. you'll right. restructure the, the, the understory for a year or so. And then that hardwood component comes back. Right. Mm. Um, and, yep. I, you know, I, I respectfully disagree a little bit on the nesting season burns. I, I think a burn is beneficial yes. no matter what yep. time of year you have to do it. It's such a small scale compared to the rest of the landscape that is not getting burned mm -hmm. during the nesting season. But if I had my druthers, I'd be burning – uh, during the winter, you know, like December through February, and then I'd be burning in the true growing season, which is like, you know, July through September or early October. Yep. So, anyway. Yep. So that's what you're, you've got some stuff you're preparing to do that with later this yep. summer. It's so. supposed to be in the summer edition. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to that article. That'll be good. Uh, anything Marcus uh, written – for us has just been fantastic and obviously this has got you involved in it as well so that'll be really good i'm excited hey this is bobby cole one of my favorite things to do as a gamekeeper is planting food plots for my deer my onyx app helps me to determine the exact plot size to make sure i'm applying the right rate of biologic seed and fertilizer try it out for yourself and see Use coupon code Mossy Oak to save 20% on your subscription to Onyx. 
Look, David, so uh, we're excited about having that article and excited about having you here. Just make yourself at yeah, home. Yeah, you need to be here every the Wednesday, couch there, if, if you don't mind. This is being filmed, right? <laughs> yeah. So, look, we've got the, the heavy hitters from the NWTF right. are joining us here. We're going to talk about helping the Yelp. Mm -hmm. And, Lanny, that doesn't mean we're going to help Dud Dudley with his calls. I thought that's what exactly what this was about. I do need a lot of help, though. Yeah, you so do. We yeah. may wow. hit on that later, I thought too. It was that's, called, that's a different entity. It's called helping the yelping. Yeah. <laughs> or hip and the yipping. I really did think it was an intervention. Uh, yeah, he, he needs the help, though, yeah, that's for right. sure. So, look, let me introduce everybody. We've got Pete Muller. Can't read my hand right in there. We got, <laughs> we've got Mark Hatfield. And we've got Travis Summer. I'm here. Travis, I'm here. my man, Travis. <laughs> How are y'all? We're, We're good. 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 We couldn't do this without you, Travis. I'm glad you're there. Oh, Lord, don't say that. I'm surprised to see you sitting in an office. This is kind of... <laughs> Bobby's sucking up to you. You must have a good place to turkey hunt. Wait, Bobby's <laughs> sucking up. Yeah. Yeah. I knew it. I knew it. I could smell Tell it from, from a mile away. Yeah. We're so invested in the NWTF. All of us, emotionally, from the... bit, It's everything. We love what you guys do job and have done. Yep. Absolute job one. And uh, so, so we're proud to have you all here. We want, we've got some... So we, You guys have this Help the Yelp program. We want to make sure that uh, we understand what's going on and we figure out how we can help and how our listeners can help. And guys, I don't know if you can see, but we got Toxie sitting at the other end. we got David Holly uh, there on the guest chair. And, and so we got a, a room full of people that love turkey. So w we are wanting to help. We are wanting to figure out. But my first question is, are y'all hearing that some parts of the United States are being affected more than others? Is there, a, is there a pocket or a state that just is bubbling up and like, boy, they sure are having a hard time with their turkeys? I'll take that real quick. I, obviously, um, anecdotally, uh, people are seeing declines. Um, and Mark can speak a little bit more to those numbers, but... Uh, you know, because he, he's got some of the hard data. But I think one of the, the quickest things to cover just right off the bat is just a just a very brief overview of what we're trying to accomplish with Help the Yelp and how the overall promotion can can help with the NWTF. And, and I'll even say up front, um, obviously, Mossy Oak, huge, huge partner. Um, and uh, some of the things that, that you guys have done are actually helping um, – with that decline um and and that being specifically the commitment to assisting with research which is a huge topic on everybody's mind right now um but at its heart help the yelp is a refocusing of messaging and letting people know that we know about the issues with the unhealthy turkey populations and we're committed just as we've always been to to working with state agencies working with partners to try to get to the bottom of it but letting them also know that this is something that we can't do alone. We've always been working for the turkey, whether it be uh, through research or, you know, if you go back to the trap and transfers, and now it's a lot on making sure that there's solid habitat. But turkey hunters need to be more invested uh, in organizations like the NWTF because we can be responsible uh, users of your dollars to help put, um, even in COVID years, 86 cents on the dollar back to mission and then match that at 10 to 1 ratios to help that work on the ground happen. So it's amazing. Um, yeah, that is amazing. You know, so, so again, uh, everything kind of in a nutshell, but we're spending a lot more time talking about the things that are important to people being, what are we able to find out through research? What do we actually know about the Turkey numbers? And, um, and I'll kick it off to Mark here, but really it's an overall unhealthy status. And that doesn't mean that there's declines everywhere, but it just means that as the wild Turkey population as a whole across the entire country, there's, there's different things that, that have to be focused on. Some of those areas are declined. Some of those areas are too many turkeys that are encroaching in on urban areas. And Mark has some more of those numbers mm -hmm. exactly kind of where things sit. Yeah, yeah, guys. So first of all, thanks for, thanks for the invite today. Uh, I think we all, you know, probably coming off a long turkey season where we spent some time in the woods and probably didn't hear as many turkeys as we wanted to hear. Um, and so... Turkey populations are, they're concerning kind of where we're sitting today. You know, I think the number we've, we've seen with our Healthy Yelp and, and really supported by some agencies, surveys and stuff that we've done, we've seen about a 10 or 15% decline in turkey population since the mid 2000s. So really about over the past 15 years, we've seen this decline or this downward trend, which is concerning. And, and I think anybody that goes out turkey hunts they're not hearing as many birds on average. They're not seeing as many birds on average. 
And that's pretty concerning. And so I think you asked the question of where are they at and, and what are the pockets that we're seeing across the country and, you know, which ones are affected the most? You know, I think there's some natural ones that come to mind. You know, there's a Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana. Um, those areas have started to see some pretty significant decline overall, which has resulted in some changing of the harvest structures within those states. You know, how many birds you can take, when did the season start? Um, we've seen that occur in Mississippi. We've seen it occur in Alabama. Georgia has reduced the bag limits. South Carolina, about three years ago, reduced bag limits from five to three after a large study. And overall, the Southeast has seen a, a fairly consistent decline in reproduction um, for wild turkeys. We see some pockets in the Northeast where we get populations that are stable, and then we get some areas where the populations are increasing. Um, the Western portion of the country, we've got some states that are seeing declines. Most are stable, and then we are seeing some states, such as South Dakota, that are wanting to liberalize a little bit. So I'd say there's about a third of the country right now that are stable, a third that's declining, and a third that's increasing in populations based on our abundance measures that we've had in place. So, man, it's tough uh, to figure out all these nuances and these variables, but, man, it's, um, it's an important thing for us to figure out, and you guys and, and many other partners have started to really step up and prioritize research um, to figure this stuff out. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll – compare this situation to the quail Oof. it was almost like uh, scary when you say that well no <laughs> i've said it before it's I mean. almost like you know with the quail all of a sudden it was like oops where'd they go yep. but with the turkeys we've picked up on it much sooner um and everybody is concerned there's just so much concern out there and you know if we're only down 10 or 15 percent since the early 2000s um i think that's commendable that uh We've picked up on it, and we're willing to all take action for it. Whereas, you know, the whole quail thing, it just seems like suddenly we decided there weren't hardly any left. Yeah. And, I mean, and it was almost – I don't want to say it was too late. Well, there was they, – they, we never knew what to do. Right. That was the bad – that was the thing that always scares everybody. There was, you just never – nobody ever came out and said, here's what's going on. Right. Here's the – and it probably was complex. But – Whatever the reason, it happened very fast. Right. And well, I'm, I'm just thankful that there's so much concern out there yes. for the wild Oh, turkey. yes, absolutely. And thanks to, you know, the love of the bird that spurred this on in the leadership, especially with hey, the Federation. Hey, thanks to these, you know? these studies, because you bring up the quail, those studies weren't going on back then, you know, like you said. And even now, by the time we're getting this data, what we've already done the season before is behind us. So, I mean, we need to, to – and not only, you know, pay attention to what's going on, but also, you know, realize that the, the data that they're serving is, you know, is is micro on a macro scale. So we have to self-regulate and see what's going on out there ourselves and make the right decisions. So. Yeah, hats off to these agencies yeah. that are making changes. We, have, we didn't have this with the quail. Yes. Yes. And I, I and didn't realize did South this, Carolina so. had changed from five to three. That's a big change yeah. there. And that, I'm sure you guys were in, involved in that. That's a that's Look, we do what we do as hunters and conservationists. But I mean, we always crow about never had a wild game species go extinct. Yeah. Populations are thriving. You know what? We will. That's why we're regulated. We adapt to what's there and hunt for what's best to continue a healthy population. And so when the yeah. ox is in the ditch, we got to put it in four wheel drive and mm -hmm. everybody has to. And, you know, it's well, we don't see everybody, but we've seen a huge increase in the number of people willing to jump in and help and donate. And just understanding that it's not just the Turkey Federation and the government and the universities doing this. Everybody should be mindful and care for their place wherever it is. That's how we get there. So as we teach them what well, to do and what's going on, you know, go ahead. Yeah, Toxie, I think that's a key point, man, is that, you know, there's, it's concerning. You know, I think we've, you know, we've been recognizing this, you know, or, or seeing it, but you've got to connect several dots to see these downward trends and populations and abundance and some of these things. But you said a key thing is that state wildlife agencies are making the best decisions 
that they, they can with the information they have available. And I think it's for us and, and you guys and, and all owners to make sure that they have available the best information to right. make the best right. decisions. You know, and, you know, they're, they're, they're entrusted with managing turkeys across the landscape for public consumption and for hunters. And so we've got to adapt. You know, waterfowl have been doing it for years. Yes. But they adjust bag limits based on counts and, and it's adaptive management. And there's a, there's a case in point here that we may need to be providing more social support for agencies to pull the lever that they can to adjust season structures and bag limits. And it takes both to ensure we have healthy populations. And, and that's just what it's going to take. We've got to be connected. And I think that's what Healthy Help is about, too. Is everybody needs to provide support, whether it's commenting publicly, whether it's, you know, in public meetings, whether it's supporting buying your hunting license, maybe it's donating to an organization, uh, you guys. But it takes us all pulling in the same direction. Uh, let me just say, I'm getting on my pulpit right now, and I apologize <laughs> if I offend anybody. But this is no time to be pointing fingers and complaining, because I've heard complaining. And honestly, what I said even publicly is like, I am for anything in any group that is going to aid and grow and nurture and care for our great, great wild turkey. But I'm not for anything that divides us up. And you said that. I, great analogy has always been when you point a finger at somebody, you got four fingers pointing back at you. This is the perfect analogy because instead of complaining, we should be saying, what can I do to help? I mean, even if you don't want to yeah. donate money, you know what? If you care about it and you're willing to complain, you should ask, what can I do to help? That's all I'm saying. So everybody out there that's concerned, should ask that question. And you know what? Us, state agencies, Turkey Federation, others, should be able to give you an answer what they can do to help. We'll give you an answer what you can do. But it'll only get where it needs to if everybody is concerned and everybody is willing to do their part at their place. They have control and say so, or they can affect, you know, habitat, harvest, you know, nest success and all those things. You made a good point about DU and ducks, but they can go to Canada and make a big difference in the nest success yep. of the ducks we have in the southern southern United States and other places. <laughs> Turkeys is so much more complicated. It has to happen on every single piece of ground. We have turkeys. And so yeah. more than ever, we need everybody who loves turkeys to say, what can I do to help? Okay, I'm out from behind the pulpit. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, I, I'm a heart. Yeah. Tack, no tack one thing on to that, Toxie. I mean, I think for a long time, we as hunters have said, you know, hey, we're, we're already doing a lot because we buy licenses. And, you know, yeah, a portion of that may go to state-level conservation work. But but I think if that's the least that you can do, there, you know, then you're, you're not stopping at the right level. There's always more that you can do. And it, it could be replying to those harvest surveys. We always get them, you know, for – for our areas. And that's something that those state agents need, state agencies need to be able to help get the best data possible. You know, poll surveys that happen later in the year, if, if you're willing to help provide and, and give some feedback on that, you know, if it's buy, buying, uh, you know, the, the turkey stamp that you guys are doing, or it's putting $35 towards the NWTF where you can get a $25 bass promo card back. Yep. I mean, we're all outdoors and we're all going to spend it anyway, but there's, there's so many little things that we can do beyond just going, Hey, I hunt turkeys. I bought a license, you know, now fix, fix my turkey problem. There's, we all care about the birds. So there's, there's plenty of other ways that we can. Become Absolutely. Part of yeah. 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 And I'm hearing guys uh, that, that, I mean, their way of giving back is I, I know several folks that are in a, a really a fairly expensive club around Selma, Alabama. And, and they've said, Hey, we're going to set our limit at two birds a person. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah. so that, that, that's their way of trying yeah, you to gotta, back. Yeah, That's a great thing to people are I've, more and more. It's not enough or, you know, as everybody's wanting to brag about getting the limit, you know, and getting the limit in a bunch of state. Well, I, I hear people kind of lightly bragging that, you know, I stopped before my limit. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was cool. I, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just like them. I mean, because it's literally just because I've concerned. And, you know, yes. I know David and their family has a great spread of habitat and turkeys, and they live right there on the place. And I think they killed, and it's a pretty good sized chunk between their land and the lease. I won't call the numbers, but. They said they killed one turkey and said, mm -hmm. that's it. We're not going to kill any more. Yep. That's it. Now, they had some other ground to hunt. 
a, a lease and friends, neighbors, you know, hunting club, a little bit of st- here and there. People invite you. But they said one turkey and they quit hunting. So, you know, uh, Pete, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I mean, there's never a good time for something like this, but this is kind of hitting after the NWTF has had two years of COVID and reduced banquets. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be a, a kind of a, it's been a tough uphill hit battle for you guys but now it, are the are the banquets back on the horizon is that working itself back out so that, that the people will be able to get information go to banquets and donate to the nwtf etc sure so oh, oh yeah well, go ahead mark well i was gonna say yeah without a doubt you know we've actually seen you know our numbers on our banquet aren't where they were pre to you know prior to covid um but our attendance is up at the banquets we've got Spending has been up, which is driving more revenue to us and for us to be able to turn that back around to the mission. Awesome. And so we've actually seen a good uptick in that. So people are energized, they're ready to go. You know, COVID actually is, there was a little silver lining in there. And again, I say, and I say that cautiously because COVID impacts a lot of people that we don't know how exactly and, and on personal and professional levels. But it drove individuals outside, people engaged. Uh, at the upcoming symposium, we've actually had a paper that's presented by Dr. Cobb and, and many other state technical uh, technical committee members, NWCS technical committee, on the COVID effect of wild turkeys. And did we see increased harvest? Did we see decreased harvest? It impacted states because people weren't able to travel to non-residents where they've typically done. But, you know, banquet numbers are not as high, but uh, spending is up and membership is up for the event that we've got. That's a very interesting point. You know, more people got outside, more people were inspired to be outside. Uh, we probably picked up more hunters. Uh, it made the harvest rates go up, and there was more people parked at every gate on public land. But uh, that's a great point. More people getting out there and getting interested. One of the things, guys, I've seen, and reiterate what Toxie said, you know, working is the phone calls that I get. Uh, related to habitat management. And, you know, you go back to not pointing fingers as as hunters, you know, we're conservationists first. Uh, you wouldn't believe the amount of phone calls I get about, you know, regarding Chufa, when should I burn? Uh, you know, things I can do to better my land to help out turkeys. You know, the research, we're working on that to try to find out the answer. But the big thing is, is a landowner or a habitat manager, what can I do to better my habitat for the turkeys? You know, whether it's I'm um, getting out there burning, uh, you know, creating better brood and nesting habitat. I know you guys talked about that about a week on the last podcast. You know, it's just it's amazing the calls I get now in the office. Hey, what can I do to have turkeys on my land? And I think it's just educating and getting people involved and, you know, everybody throwing themselves in the hat and, and doing what they can to do it, make it better, better habitat, at least for sure. I, I will say too, it is it is heartening because it, it is not common because we do have headwinds and there's a multitude of factors. It's not one thing, but in general, the people that take matters into their own hands that go do something about it themselves are seeing more and more success uh, lately. And I know um, for the most part, those people that have over time done those things that we all talk about in the NWTF and state agencies preach to enhance. I mean, because the one thing, turkeys are a little different than deer. I mean, you've really got to, you got to have a deer to, um, you know, to be born and survive to be four or five years old, basically, to get where you want to. Now, I know not everybody waits that long, and to, but if you want to let them become what you're really after. And there's a lot of natural mortality you know, beyond just fawns getting eaten when they're born and stuff, um, and especially on bucks. But in turkeys, it seems to be so much simpler as far as what you, if you can get them hatched and get them to 14 days old, it's crazy how low that mortality rate is and how much success. So if you can just do that, have a successful hatch and get the little post where they can fly, you can make a tremendous difference in what happens. And so that's what we can all focus on. And beyond there, there's other factors for sure. But what I was just getting at, there's such a, you know, that focus right there can make a giant difference, and it's not as complicated. You know, you don't have to – because 
let's just say if a turkey becomes a two-year-old, he's fair game, and a goblin strutting turkey is a trophy. You know, very, very few people are, like, culling them because they don't have a big enough beard or whatever. <laughs> and so the return is so much faster, too, yeah. than having to, you know, one grows to be five years old and maybe makes into, you know, a Pope and Young or whatever. That's a good point. So, hey, Travis, while you're on screen – you're still managing that big chunk of ground right outside of Edgefield for turkeys, I assume. Is there oh, something yeah. you can share with that, our listeners? That's why you caught me inside today. That's where I was, and I made a mad dash inside since that <laughs> time of year. Uh, yeah, we are. We we continue to, to manage the property, um, mainly – four turkeys, deer, songbirds, we've got, and believe me, guys, we got plenty of turkeys out back. They just didn't want to cooperate real well with us this year with our, uh, taking our new hunters back there. But yeah, we spent a lot of time uh, working on the property so we can showcase it to landowners, uh, state agencies that host workshops here. Uh, we've got a couple coming up this summer. So it's, you know, it's year round. Um, and even my, the private land that I have that I manage, you know, as soon as you step out of your turkey hunting gear, you're riding boots on the ground and getting back after it, you know, taking care of the land, you know, giving back. So, you know, we've got 707 acres out back that now for seven years, um, you know, we developed, got plenty of turkeys back there. It's a good way to show people that taking care of the ground, rotational burning. We, we did a lot of stuff this year out back. Uh, mainly along the lines of, of producing nesting and brood habitat. Uh, we did a lot of fallow disking back in February in abandoned fields. We did uh, a lot of control burning, you know, early on. Uh, didn't get a lot what I like to have gotten done, but it's all about using this piece of property to showcase it, to let other folks know what you can do to make better habitat. And of course, you know, we're still running our new hunter hunts back there. Uh, I think we had eight different hunts this spring, uh, taking folks back there. Um, you know, they got to hear some turkeys gobble and had some close calls, but you know, that's a great part of what NWTF is doing is we're just continuing to, to try to push the needle to get more people, get new hunters out there and talk about conservation. And that's what we're doing on the property. Sure. It's, it, I think one of the, the neat, one of the neat things about the property back there is that it's it's not just one type of habitat i mean it's pretty diverse you know you've got uh you know hardwood pockets you've got some stuff where we're doing some work with long leaves uh you know there's some, i believe there's some more short leaf areas i mm -hmm. mean but but travis can cover all the ground on on all the different things that are happening there but again it's it's not just serving one single property in one way to try to get one result it, there's there's a lot of different moving parts on that piece that are all happening at once yep yeah, I've I've gotten the tour, the Travis tour out there. It's been a few <laughs> years, but I don't know if I've been on a more diverse piece of property. It's no doubt. it's one of the coolest. Uh, you know, if you're going to call it a recreational track, there's uh, something for everybody out there. You know, the the dove field is amazing. It's covered in turkeys. It's got deer. Giant bat house. Yeah, bat houses, <laughs> oh, yeah. bird houses. You know, you got. <laughs> Uh, songbirds flying around all over the place. You're kicking up grasshoppers everywhere you go. It's yeah, it's just a stuff. it's a, a showcase uh, it place. Really is. So Travis, besides uh, you know the the first answer almost always is chufas and burning. Besides those two things, what could you what would you suggest to a guy to, to help with this property? Are there things that you're planning for for mm -hmm. turkeys that you're getting results from? We, you know, one of the key things, and, I, and Dudley just mentioned, is diversity. You know, all of us, that's what, you know, the gamekeepers are about, what we're about at NWTF when it comes to habitat. Of course, we're across the whole United States. You know, diversity is, is key. I like to see diversity in our food plots out here. We do everything, of course, with chufa. Uh, we plant a lot of clover. Um, and, of course, a lot of burning on the property, I think, is some key things uh that we have out there we do some midsummer annual plantings uh mainly with you know different a variety of millet and sorghum and we kind of strip plant that but i did shift a lot of emphasis this year um along the lines of really just uh what i'm gonna call becoming a insect or a bug farmer trying to create these these brood habitats and being able to get into some fallow disking um 
and creating that natural vegetation where, you know, young turkeys, we do have, a, you know, we talked about quail earlier. Uh, we've got several coveys of quail on the property. And, you know, the more it seems like we do, you know, manipulate and do different things on the property. A lot of hardwood trees on the property that we're taking care of. A lot of them through native nurseries. We've got, you know, our orchards out there uh, also. So it's just creating that diversity with clover, chufa. I'll, I'll give a, a big shout out to what we do with controlled burning in the winter months. Uh, and then this year, really with some of this early successional habitat through mowing and fallow disking. Uh, we had one field this year that we had turkeys in uh, early on. And every morning, that's where they went. Well, we had done all this fallow disking in February, come 1st of April. That's where they wanted to be first thing in the morning. You'd see the hens feeding through those fields. So diversity is key. And that's what we're, that's kind of the key components, burning clover, chufa, and now getting into the, the brood habitat that we're trying to do, to create out there. Wow. Yeah, think, so um, real quick, guys, I, I'd add I'd add one thing to that. Availability. Yep. Is prescribed burning that's done across, you know, a third or, or more of the land on an annual basis uh, in the southeast anyway. And you've got bugs. You've, you've got this, this mosaic of habitat that is available to turkeys throughout the landscape or throughout that piece of property. I think so often we focus on the, the five to ten percent of the property that's in food plots, and we forget about creating this early successional habitat or brood habitat, for general terms, to make it available across the entire piece of property. And so it's, you know, that way turkeys can use it all. And so, you know, Dr. Chamberlain's made some posts about this, and we talked about this, but it's the availability of good habitat for turkeys that is. We have turkey habitat, but sometimes it's in pockets. And so these are wanderers, and you've got to have that availability to turkeys on the habitat that you're creating. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Pete, uh, what help me, are there components to this Help the Yelp that, that, uh, that we hadn't discussed that, you, that we need to? You know, I, I think the, the biggest thing is, again, kind of at its heart, the the Help the Yelp campaign is is somewhat of a membership drive, but it's really, again, that renewed focus or that more shifted focus to to putting a bigger light on the the work that's going on, which we haven't ever stopped doing work, but it's, it's being a little bit more targeted in how we frame that work is what it's doing for turkeys on the ground. Because, you know, some of the big landscape level initiatives and things like that that we're doing, it's very easy to lose focus if somebody's reading about those things that we're involved in. It, they go, man, they're, they're doing a lot of conservation work or, you know, conserving or enhancing a lot of acres. But, like, how's that affecting my turkeys? And I, th I think so what we're doing is we're, we're trying to spend more time in relaying that through the messaging of, of the, the work that's actually going on on the ground um, because that's really – what hits home for us turkey hunters is we want to know where are the dollars going how how is this going to help my turkeys uh you know in the long run and, and so i think the the better job that we can do about that but also say hey we're at a point where you know there's a lot of turkey hunters out there that when they got their start whether that be late 90s early 2000s in in those areas they have never seen an issue with turkeys before they have never seen an issue they've always been able to go out and see turkeys on the landscape and there's still people now that, that aren't having any issues, even in areas of decline, they go, Hey, my farm's just fine. Um, but it's, if we try to get it to where everybody's looking at the entire landscape of turkeys that in a U.S. population as a whole, not just, you know, what's the population in this County in my state, but how are things going on everywhere? We can get people to think about the bigger picture and potentially return to a time where people were willing to sacrifice birds from their own backyard to have it transplanted somewhere else because they knew of the greater good that it was going to come from for all turkey hunters and turkeys in general. But right now I think it's, we've, we've got to get back to that mindset of thinking about, you know, how, how can we work for turkeys as a one big population instead of, you know, just little tiny pockets here and there. What's all the great work that's going on that's making that a reality. 
So y'all's ask is for people to come to the banquets and and join and be, be, be renew their membership with the NWTF. And if I heard you correctly, like eighty six cents of every dollar goes back to the turkeys. Is that is that right? Typically, typically in a in a non COVID year, it's ninety cents, ninety one cents on the dollar. Even in COVID, where things were a whole lot tougher to come by, it was eighty six cents on the dollar supporting the mission. Yeah, that's and awesome. so when when you sit there and you can look at those numbers, you can say the NWTF is a solid investment for your passion of, of turkeys. Um, and again, knowing that that dollar ratio can then be leveraged for partners uh, and to get additional work done at a rate of average and maybe 10 to one, Mark may correct me on that. Uh, it might be more than that. Um, but there's again, great possibilities to get things done. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at David Holly. He's David, if you've got a question that you wanted to ask, you you were kind of look, I he's thought, leaned in. I know he's you, you leaned in like you I did. No, 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 I I just think this is a great opportunity. I mean, I've been seeing the decline firsthand for the last eight years, and the year that it hit me was in about 2015. You go from not worrying about turkeys and thinking some of these calls were 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 silly to all of a sudden you're not hearing turkeys. 70% of the turkey, the mornings you go hunting. And so it's, it, it becomes reality to you. And I think a lot of people have come to the realization it's not just internet fodder anymore. It's reality. And so mm-hmm. I've always been very struck by the early work of, you know, the NWTF, the people that brought the turkeys back in, in the thirties and forties and started the restoration process with a lot of admiration and always wanted to make sure that I, as a hunter and conservationist, I guess did them right would be the best way to say it. And the fact that they didn't bring the resource back for me to be someone that trampled upon the resource and what they blessed with. And really we've got what, two and a half, three million turkey hunters, if not more out there, everyone can do something to be a part of the story of the wild turkey. We're still writing this book. We want to make sure that this chapter we're in um, is a good one. And I just think about, I don't want my kids or grandkids to ever, you know, wonder what it's like not to have turkeys. Yeah, so. no doubt. Oh, about yeah, it. big time. I think about it all the time. Yeah. I do too. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I've I've been turkey hunting for thirty three years, and I'm forty five years old. And so, I've been lucky enough to work with NWTF, and and honestly, you know, I think we've worked too hard collectively as a community to bring birds back to where they're at to let up yeah. you know and so when we when we think about what we're doing i mean we got to honor all the hard work for everybody else that's got us here today and then we've got to continue to build upon it now the good thing is is man we've got the wildlife agency professionals researchers the, the universities and, and all the researchers across the country i mean they're invested i mean uh you guys are invested we've got you know others that are providing support for research and we're, we're turning that money back into projects because we want to figure this out because we've come too far to, to let up. And so it's going to, it's a different challenge, but honestly, it's a challenge that we're capable of figuring out. Yeah, I think so too. Absolutely. Yeah. So look, we, we appreciate you guys being here and, and, and talking this up. And I want to make sure that we cover everything we want to. There was, do you need to mention anything about the symposium? Is there something uh, there that we need to discuss? Yeah, so so we probably have heard used the term symposium, and so the, there's a every on average every five years since 1959 there has been a wild turkey symposium that brings together all the brightest minds and turkey managers from across the country to share research, to engage in conversations, and to share challenges across jurisdictions. And so this one's coming up. We have the 12th symposium coming up in June of this year, June 6th through the 10th in Asheville, North Carolina. And it's going to be an opportunity for all of us, NWTF partners, state agencies, um, land-grant institutions, new wildlife students. We've got students participating. We have industry participating to come talk about wild turkeys and the challenges we face. So that's going to be great. We're going to be uh, announcing uh, some of our grant recipient during that week as well. That's the byproduct of some of your all support as well, where we did a request for proposals 
we got seven or eight proposals in, and then they said, hey, we want to work on this and wild turkeys, and then we're getting our state agency partners to help us select which ones are the most, have the most applicability to their work. So we're making sure the research aligns the needs. And so that symposium's coming up. It's going to be fun. It's going to be the, I mean, everything turkey. The, the people that know everything about turkeys on the state agency side of things and the academic side of things are going to be in Asheville, North Carolina, June 6th through the 10th. No, that sounds well, that sounds like a place we need to be. So, Lanny, are, be. Are, we need to we need you there. I, I think that's the man that needs to be there. Right you just there. went. We you, got our boss at practice conference. I know how to get up there. Yeah. <laughs> but but no, we're going to have some people up there, there for sure. You know, Mark, I'm so excited about this. I've obviously uh, I'm a nerd about all the research that Chamberlain and Collier and so many put out. But you know, we 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 kind of curse social media sometimes. But what a incredible. Uh, divine intervention a little bit that some of these challenges going on are going on in the age of social media where you all can get the information out there to people that are able to uh, help support the agencies and the organizations by their public support, but also do these things on their own place yes. to help the, the collective fabric of, of the yep. wild turkey. Excellent point. Yes. Yep. No, I mean, it, it's imperative that we apply what we learn at the appropriate scale, local, state, regional, national, you know, and, and maybe some people have forgot this or have, it, it kind of slipped out of their mind is that in 1973, the NWTF was founded as a research organization dedicated to the wild turkey. And since, since that time, we gave our first research grant away in 1978. And since that time, we've, We've allocated $8.3 million to wild turkey research of NWTF funds, leveraged three or four to one. So you start doing the math, you know, so we're dedicated to the research. We got to figure it out, but we've got a great group. We've got great partners and we got great support to do so. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. It, and it, the NWTF has just got a, a long history of, of, some, of, of, of what you guys have done. And a lot of times y'all hadn't, y'all hadn't, put it out there for everybody to know the research and the projects that were it was just your job to do that. So and, uh, and now it's, a, it is, a, it's, it's interesting to see what all's been going on. And uh, we're, we're just so excited about the, the attention that, uh, it, that is being given the Turkey. And uh, yeah, I'm fascinated to find out more and more and more because no there are there. I think they would agree. There are multiple, uh, you know, issues going on. And I think that we'll find more and more of that. There may be four to six or more issues, but depending on where you are geographically, the percentage of that issue that's more of a headwind for your turkey population will change and adapt. So it's, it's not, they're not going to be a big cross section. Here's the answer. Here's the answer globally. And that's why it's so important for everybody to be paying attention and everybody you know, there's a lot known already as to some of the headwinds to wild turkey populations and things you can do to take matters in your own hands and help. And that's what we want to keep bringing to people more and more and more. Now, some of those things are going to have to be handled by big agencies and by the states and whatever. But so much of the health of the population is up to individual landowners or land stewards. You don't even have to own land. But if you have mm -hmm. a place you can go and do the work, it's just as good. Sure. Sure. Well, Pete, Mark, yeah. Travis, we sure we sure are appreciative of what you guys are doing, and the rest of the people up there at, at, in Edgefield and scattered all over the United States. The people that represent the NWTF. Absolutely, we, absolutely. We would highly encourage people to attend a banquet. They're a lot of fun. Dudley, you go every year to a banquet, and yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, come back with some artwork, and especially the national convention. That's a lot of fun. Oh my but gosh, I, yes. I really enjoy the local one too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you want to seem like you want a gun about every other year, or somebody around here does. I don't know where you <laughs> lucky does. That. <laughs> so, like, uh, look before we let you guys go, uh, Mac. You want to ask them a trivia question? Well, oh, guess we, trivia. we always trivia ask our guests a trivia question. Stump so collectively, y'all can work together to get this answer. Yeah, we've, you can phone a friend right quick. And, and <laughs> so, if you get this right, we've got a listener that you'll be playing for that wins a prize. And so, Mac's going to tell us all about it. Yes, so you are playing. You all are playing for M persons, and if you get this right, 
then he or she will get a Levy Gamekeeper Gunsling. I know nice. him, Parsons. Mm-hmm. Do you? Yeah. I do too. Right. He's also a podcaster. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's called Strut Marks. Yep. You know him. He can oh. yelp. Yeah, he can yelp with the he best. He might album. have a gamekeeper gunsling. Yeah, coming up. <laughs> All right, so let's see All what depends on these guys. See if you guys can uh, can answer this question. So this is a true or false question. Can a wolf smell its prey up to two miles away? True or false? We talking about a red wolf or a gray wolf or a timber wolf? Oh, <laughs> oh. Uh, we'll just go with whatever we'll just go with wolf, wolf. Yeah. whatever wolf you, you desire. All of the above. <laughs> oh man, you need wolf. Mark, don't fade out now. Yeah, Mark, where are you? <laughs> yeah, Mark's on Ass Jeeves right yeah. now. Can we use the live line real quick? Hold on. I, I I'm here. So, um, well, Travis, what do you think? <laughs> Depends on how windy the day is. <laughs> <laughs> Depends. <laughs> you know, thinking. It's just a true or false. Yeah. True or false, I'm going to say. I'd say Mark. true, but but I, I don't want to be go. The There you go. <laughs> look at, look at Pete. I don't know Pete. Said true. Everybody hit the air. <laughs> yeah. Be brave. You got a 50-50 chance. Yeah, Pete, you pulled yeah, him through. Good. All right. Well, I'm sorry if we put y'all on the spot, but uh, we, we thought y'all <laughs> no. might that might come easy too. But we were fascinated to know that wolves can smell up to and past two miles when they're tracking an animal. Wow, wow. That, that's just a, how does anything that's survive amazing. around them? No. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, thank you guys for having us on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll also say thank you to all the members, volunteers, the boots on the ground making the work happen. Man, um, guys like us, you know. Yeah, we we do help do some work uh, out of headquarters, but a lot of the time, the work that we're doing is just supporting those members, volunteers, those real people making things happen. They're those incredible. real people, the partners, yeah. everybody that makes the NWTF the great organization that it is. So we're appreciative of everybody that's that's involved in this this great organization that's that's dedicated to that that bird that we all love. Awesome, yeah. awesome family, yeah. awesome family right. of people, the, just Good. servants. Yeah. Well said, and, and thanks to Mossy, thanks to everybody on this call, thanks to all of your all supporters as well. I mean, partnerships and, and great people, you know, make our organization strong. So thank you for everything. Yeah, to- thank you guys. It's it's the partnerships that make it strong. It's about educating people, and as you say, it's 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 going to take us all as hunters. That's you know, right. we all got to pitch in and make a difference. That's the truth. And it's all about the gobble. It's all about the gobble. That's right. I hear you. Chill hear bumps. You. Yep. There it is. Yep. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. We appreciate really appreciate guys. it. Thank appreciate you. Take care. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. See you okay. soon. See you. Open up. Yeah. I don't know how we could sp- – I mean, he, he, uh, Pete just summed that up perfectly there. So, Wow. Well, look, why don't we, while we've got, uh, let's do our Ask Dudley. Let's keep the ball rolling there. Right. Yeah, I've, I've got a good one uh, for today. So this is from Dale Arnett. Dudley, I saw a couple of your recent Instagram stories you did with the persimmon flowers being either male or female, and I missed all of them. Can you help me out with an easy way to tell the difference? Ours aren't blooming yet here in Missouri, and I hope uh, to mark as many as I can this year. All right. Um, good question, Dale. And yeah, I, I did some of those. I'm trying to get better at Instagram, but I did some of those quizzes where you click yes or no yeah. or whatever, and then it tells you whether you were right or wrong. But uh, I was out on a walk the other day and noticed all the persimmons were flowering. And so I snapped some photos. Um, so an easy way for me, uh, you know, when you're, when you see the big fruits in the fall they always have that brown hard uh thing connected to the top it looks like a star yeah exactly Uh, that's called a calyx c-a-l-y-x and uh on the female flowers it's it's green and very enlarged it's it's almost bigger than the flower itself um and on the male flowers of course there's different uh parts on the male versus the female flowers but the easy way to know is that 
that green calyx is roughly the size of the flower, if not larger, on the female fruit-producing flowers. And then the male on the male trees, you have the same white, you know, cream-colored flowers, but there's a lot more of them. They're much closer together. And then that green part at the top of the flower is not enlarged. It's very small. So the calyx is bigger on the The calyx trees. is much bigger on, on the, the females. Female trees. Yeah. Okay. I so, guess it'll be easier to recognize the more developed the flowers are. Well, it's a small window. Oh, it is? Yeah, but um, it's generally once once the flower has developed and you see that, you know, the, the flower part is white colored, um, the calyx is also going to be fully developed. Okay. And it's just much larger right. than it is on the male. So, Man, that's good stuff right yeah. there. If in doubt, a tall tree, a pair of binoculars would tell you instantly, too. It, exactly. And you know now nowadays you can just pull up some photos on on Google and what I just did screenshot yeah. do the screenshots and have them on your phone to compare them when you when you mm -hmm. get there. Mm -hmm. So thank what? you, Mister Know It All. That was a good one. Yeah, there you go, Dudley. Yeah, you there, always again, impressed. There's, there's a lot more little technical things you can look at to key them out, but that's the easiest way to do it in a nutshell. So. And that's how we like to do things around here, yes. in the easy way. <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> so. so what did we learn today? It, 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 tell me what you learned, Lanny. Uh, you know, just how – keep reinforcing how important research is. You know, uh, Dudley early on made the analogy of the quail, and we didn't have as much information as we have available to us now. So, you know, the importance of that and also the importance of what you're, what you're observing in the field, limiting your own self. These guys, these studies aren't going on everywhere. You know, they're going in very specific spots, and, and we're making decisions over broad areas off of, of what's happening. So I just encourage and, and learn, you know, more and more every day that it's up to us to see what we have going on and make personal decisions ourselves, you know, to do more, obviously, for the wild turkey. If we need to limit our harvest, limit our harvest, and, uh, you know, just do what's right for the resource all the time. Mm. Yep. David, did you learn anything? Absolutely. Um, anytime in the presence of you guys, oh, you know, whatever. I learned something, whatever. especially Dudley. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Thank you. Dudley, you know, I've got a friend that's a lot like you. He's never answered, I'm not sure, to a question because his thought is either he knows the answer or you don't, so he can just come up with it. <laughs> right. But no, seriously. I a lot of my answers I get from other people. I just obsess <laughs> over what these PhDs are doing, Yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, I like to I like to regurgitate it. He is our encyclopedia. Yeah. So I, I, I'd like us to come back in the future, and, and maybe it's in the next six or eight weeks. But but have uh, get Marcus back on here and talk about these uh, uh, these growing season fires and the fallow disking. That because yes. that's something I think a lot of people could probably take advantage of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The more I heard it this year, the more I've paid attention in the last months about this early successional habitat and. What that really means. And, you know, we questioned him last time. He They throw it out as a buzzword, and I was like, time out. Explain to the really novice mean? exactly what you're talking about. And, you know, it's it's a little bit complex, but it's still the same thing in helping people understand. Today they talked about diversity, and that is, but what are those parts of diversity they're talking about? So, yeah, I think we could keep helping people understand more and more the the key components of that diversity sure yes and what does it look like yes and so it, we've yes. got we've actually you don't know this but, but but we've got a gamekeeper television show scheduled with dr craig harper and marcus helped set that up Good. to look at and it'd show us what this early successional habitat like. uh, and so i'm real excited about that david well, you, have my, you, bobby like the late season burning i'm talking about that's a great opportunity to combine Yes. Some of the things that you're already doing, if you're already having a disc up food plot, let's mm -hmm. go ahead and take that same disc and put in your fire lanes when you're doing that. Yep. You can even go ahead and plant clover on those fire lanes. So I think it's just the mindset of, of not trying to segment your work, but maybe combine right. your efforts right. in doing some of this. We always want to compartmentalize these things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hey, have to be that way. And you're killing ticks too, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I that's a good you're thing. helping, <laughs> sure. For sure. sure. Yeah. Mac, I'm looking at you. You got anything over there from... I, I, I do. My takeaway from all this is, is, I mean, when you 
go in the woods, you don't hear as many turkeys. It's just kind of a somber time, and, and we talk about that time a lot. But you can look at this also in a positive light that, I mean, there is a light being shed on this mm -hmm. and that there are actions being done and there are organizations, you know, putting their money where their mouth is. And, and that, to me, is exciting. And so I, I take away it as a positive moment uh, for the wild turkey. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I mean, the I have a positive vibe for the future. You know, I'm excited oh, yeah. about the future. I'm I'm not that concerned. I I think we're going to make it happen. Well, well, Dudley, we all see, like Travis said, we have more people contacting us in our own venues of saying, hey, because of the things that y'all have been preaching from the podcast or Wild Turkey Reporter, NWTF, I'm starting to do these things. And so that fabric of people that are working to create the habitat and the situations that benefit the wild turkey, you start looking at this this quilt work starting starting to get made mm -hmm. of people that are 365 days a year thinking about the wild turkey and working towards the wild turkey versus simply opening day to closing day right. of their season. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, if, you, if, if we were to get people to just put their thumbs in suspenders about – you know what? And and be boastful. How many did I raise? Mm -hmm. Instead of how many did I shoot? I mean, because if you really, really care about them, you'll keep a balance to that instead of just worried about how much, how many I shoot. And I may, you know, people may not like me saying that, but it's just, we just speak the truth about this. Yeah. And so if you love them so much, and you love to kill them so much, you'll actually put raising them first. And, you know, and then hunting within the balance of that, you know. Sure. Because sure. if, if I've got a place, that's a place I'm stuck with. I'm going to try to make it where it's going to be good. I, I, I want to be able to go out and hear turkeys when I go. And so I'm worried about how many we have, not necessarily how many we kill. If we had a power back on that, so be it. Yep. That sounds good. Lanny, are you emailing again? Nope. Okay. Well, look, what I've got also, I'm going to change gears up. Oh, so, no, no, uh, no. Don't embarrass me in front of everybody. Well, right? our friends at ATN, they make the thermal scopes. <clears throat> uh, good gear. I've been heard, heard about you ever. having all kind of problems with the wild pigs. And that you know you should take it personal. That should if you've got a rifle to put that on a brownie rifle, would be perfect. It it would uh, help go a long way to alleviating some of your pig problems. Wow. I think because wow. now, so you can go out there. It's a thermal scope. It's the best one they make. It's even in your favorite camouflage pattern. Imagine oh that. man, unbelievable! Yeah. <laughs> but, but, hey, can but, I borrow that? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but guys, if you'll Google ATN Corp, the, these thermal scopes, they are incredible. And if you've got a wild pig problem, this is a solution no that's doubt. a lot of fun as well and the the technology has drastically improved in the last several years and they're Man, i can't wait price wise very much in reach yes it, you're right it, it, it has come way down yep. you, there's the, the the internet is full of videos of people shooting pigs on uh peanut fields in south georgia and now that then those that was were real expensive hunts that guys had military grade but now that technology is available for the average wow. person yep Yep. So we're going to start a new organization. They have the help the yelp. We're going to boink the oink. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yeah. You came up with that quick. Yeah. Yeah. So, who, who writes your materials, yeah. Taxi? We need to get them right. Yeah. Thank like you. I'll be here all week, as <laughs> Bobby would say. <laughs> yeah, that is a pretty scope, though. Wow. And that better is, in bottom uh, land. Better better in bottom land. It looks complicated. It looks so complicated. Well, I bet you. It's definitely battery operated. Yeah, we we'll get let Vandy set that <laughs> yeah. up. No, wait a minute. I don't see yeah, Vandy's got plenty of it. Yeah. All right, guys. Amazing. Do we have anything else to cover, David? Thank you for being here. Yeah, we for being love here, seeing David. you. Yeah, this is great. Right there, one thirty next Wednesday. Okay. Right. Yep. Sounds good. Yep. <laughs> Mac, uh, always good to see you, Richie. I'm glad you've been around here today. Thank you for uh, Ooh, uh, holding us, uh, holding it all together, and. Does oh anybody gosh. else have anything? Toxic? So thankful for my new toy. I can't wait to get out there. <laughs> All right. Dude. Well, why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Mac Mac. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland. <laughs>